Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody as we get ready for our next session. It's going to take a couple uh, seconds to let everybody start to filter in and log in. Hope everybody's enjoying the day and learning a lot about hemp farming, best practices. I'm very excited about this next session. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. John Miller is a friend of mine and has been a longtime advocate of farmers and entrepreneurs seeking to get into hemp and cannabis. As a principal in multiple hemp-based companies and as a hemp farmer himself, today he's going to talk to you about the business of uh, farming for cannabinoids and what that looks like. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and let John take the floor. And if you guys have any questions for him, don't forget to push your Q&A button at the end. We'll be doing a live question and answer session at the end of uh, John's session. With that, I introduce John Miller. All right. Well, hello, everybody. And uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, I am John Miller. I work with uh, multiple companies, partners in multiple companies. Um, and it's my absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to speak with you guys today. I'm going to pop up my uh, presentation here. This is kind of new to all of us. This is, I guess, the new way of doing, of doing it in the COVID era. So today I'm going to speak to you guys about farming cannabinoids. Uh, we're going to go over a couple things, understanding the market, what is the market, creating new products, how to avoid oversaturation, and how to save your farm if you've been, if you've been pushing it as hard as a lot of the farmers and that, uh, that we work with have. Um, so that being said, let me, let me jump right in here and get this, get this thing moving. All right, so a quick overview. The current retail market for the sales of CBD is still growing, but the supply of biomass from the 2019 crop uh, is, is basically, it, it expanded faster. So we had a whole bunch of CBD that was grown, CBD flour that was grown last year, and CBD for biomass that was grown last year. Uh, problem was that you had more grown than you had an uh, outlet for it. And so as a result, things, really kind of went south this this last fall uh the supply chain had significant issues uh considering the volume of cbd hemp that was harvested it just it outpaced the demand as, as i was mentioning um and the prices man they they really did go down uh there was a bunch of hot and moldy product issues uh we had hot crops from people that were selling seed that was that was not not as advertised, so a lot of seed going 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0.7 uh, percent THC, and a lot of a lot of crop ended up going moldy because we had environmental challenges. A lot of rain in, in Oregon, right at the wrong time, uh, September, beginning of September, right when we didn't need it. Um, there's also a few things that are that are going to be coming down the road. I'm not really going to touch on those so much today, but the new, the new USDA regs they're going to change how and what we grow for sure. And most importantly, the consumers are really beginning to look at labels. They're asking for more specific blends of cannabinoids. So they want to see more CBG, uh, CBN, CBC, some of these other cannabinoids that to this point have been considered minor cannabinoids. They're beginning to, the consumers really begin to realize just how valuable those particular cannabinoids are for their bodies. So understanding the market, this is kind of a basic farming 101 for those folks that are just getting into hemp. So the folks that have been in it, this may be a little bit of just common knowledge, but farmers large and small grow hemp for cannabinoids. This is, this specifically is about growing hemp for cannabinoids. I'm not talking about hemp for biomass. Uh, the farmers then sell their product in two forms, flowers and biomass, um, and excuse me, not biomass, but like industrial, uh, industrial, biomass, um, fiber, and seed is what I was referring to. Anyhow, farmers basically sell their product in two forms, flour and biomass. Uh, flour and biomass are two distinct markets, and that's really important to understand. Each of them has their own ways of doing things. Flour is dried and trimmed and cured before being sold. And biomass is dried and sent to the lab for extraction. Uh, the finished goods, are then sold to manufacturers for resale to the public. Um, extracted products like oils and powdered uh, uh, 
powdered isolates are then put into vape pens or tinctures or rubs or drinks or pills. Um, and then the flour is sold as bags. They'll put it in baggies or they'll put it in jars um, or they'll put it in pre-rolls or hemp cigarettes. So it's kind of an overview of, of where kind of what you're growing, where it's going to end up. Uh, what is the market looking for? Well, today in May 2020, um, the demand is, is really going towards new products, right? These folks want to see new and novel products. So they've seen a lot of tinctures out there. So if you're selling a tincture, you better have something that's noticeably different than the other guy or your price better be better than the other guy. Um, and the compute, the consumer is really getting much more sophisticated in what they're, they're looking for. So we make a product for, a, for another uh, company called Always Holistic. I formulated a product that has a lot of CBG in it. Um, and it's got about a thousand milligrams of CBD, 250 milligrams of CBG. That product for them has just taken off. Like they cannot sell. And even in, th even in this time, they, they, are, uh, they cannot get enough of it for sale, which has been really surprising. We've been very happy to see that, but we've had a lot of really interesting feedback from that. And now that the consumer has, has had an opportunity to try that, um, when they go back to regular CBD product, they're like, that CBD product doesn't do enough for me. It's just not, it's not getting rid of my particular ailment or my, you know, whatever it is, like pain or their uh, insomnia or whatever. Um, and so it really is true that consumers are, are aware that multiple cannabinoids along with terpenes are much more effective at treating their health issues. Um, that's really important to, to understand because when you're, when you're growing, remember, uh, I always say, if you can smell it, I can sell it. And that's the truth. Um, the best flowers that you're growing will have the best terpene profiles, and those tend to make the best medicine overall. Um, and consumers are really looking for, for that broader array of not just cannabinoids, but also terpenes um, and flavonoids. There are, there are products coming on. Ed edible hemp is a very real thing. I'm partners in a company called Hemp Lettuce. Uh, that's a very real thing. It's very good for you for juicing and such as that. So the market right now is really looking for diversification. They're looking for new products, something that somebody else doesn't have, and they're just trying to find new ways of enjoying the product. Uh, and I've been quoted as saying this multiple times, that CBG really is the cannabinoid of the future. CBG can be converted into other cannabinoids, everything from, so CBG can be converted into Delta-8 THC or CBN or CBC or CBL or CBT. Um, even the variants, CBDV, so the cannabidiol variant, and some of the other, um, uh, almost all of the other cannabinoids can come by way of CBGA, cannabigerol um, acid, cannabigerolic acid. Um, the, that, so that's the demand on the consumer side. What the, what the demand on the, um, from the laboratory side is they need a stable supply of good biomass to make one of four products. So most labs are making one of four products. They're either producing a crude oil, they're producing a broad spectrum oil, so it's a, an oil that has had the THC removed, they're producing a full spectrum oil that still has a THC in it, or they're producing an isolate from any one of the cannabinoids that come out of it. They in turn provide those supplies to the market. And you know they, they will take those and make them into water soluble products uh, that can be used in drinks or in, in other edible products, um, or they'll just supply them uh, to tincture manufacturers and such. So uh, it's, it's really important to understand that that's what the market's looking for is they want a stable supply and they don't want heavy metals or pesticides. They need clean, uh, clean supply. So I always tell people your biomass will create your oil. I'll get through this re really quick here. This is a COA on biomass and a COA on oil. Um, so whatever you're going to see here, it's going to concentrate on whatever you're going to see in your biomass is going to concentrate into your oil and your, your numbers are going to grow up, go up dramatically. Um, 
full spectrum versus broad spectrum oil. Full spectrum is inherently unstable. And what I mean by that is that if I take a crop, um, let's say I, I farm 20 acres of um, bo uh, cherry wine, which I wouldn't do, but of cherry wine. Um, and I do that in Southern California and I took cuts from that and I grew it in Northern California. I would have two different oils at harvest. And the reason is because the environmental changes and how we water them and all these things, how much sun they get, all these things are gonna, are gonna have an impact on your terpene profile, your flavonoid profile, your cannabinoid profile. So all that's gonna change. And so you're never gonna get the exact same full spectrum oil time and time again. Um, that's really important um, if you're trying to put forward stable medicine. What I like to, what I like to tell people is there, it's, it's as different as producing aspirin and Tylenol or maybe even aspirin and Pepto-Bismol. Um, you're, you're not going to get the same effect if something has a 70% CBD and a 3% CBC content as you would if it has a 65% CBD and a 1% CBC content. So, so really um, customizing that spectrum is critical to the future of the industry. Broad spectrum is also inherently unstable with the exception of THC. Um, you really have no, there's no consistency with regard to your other cannabinoid levels. Um, different combinations of cannabinoids and terpenes, like I said before, will create different effects. Cannabinoids work better together and we know this. This is a recent study that was published in January of 2020. It shows that CBG and CBC kill gastrointestinal gastro intestinal cancer. Um, that's significant. And another thing that was significant is that when they tried the same thing with cannabichromine acid and cannabigerolic acid, so CBCA and CBGA, they didn't have the same effect. So, you know, what form that cannabinoid comes in really matters. And this is where science is going, is the pharmacological value of these cannabinoids is going to be really, really important um, going forward. And that's where the money is going to be made, because there's going to be a lot of pharma pharmacological or, or um, pharmaceutical companies that are going to come online in the next few years looking for cannabinoids. However, some of those aren't going to be coming from hemp. I promise you they're going to be coming from um, the East um, because that's just the way they are. However, we're, we're hemp farmers. We believe that the best way to get those cannabinoids is from hemp. Okay, so oversaturation, real quick, the 2019 harvest lesson to date. Well, quality of the product was an issue. Uh, weather took its toll on a crop for sure. Anybody in Montana will tell you. I had a conversation with a gentleman in Montana in August and, and uh, told him, you know, look, I think that you're going to get some snow. And he told, he told me point blank, uh, we're not going to get snow. I've been here for 30 years. We don't get snow this time of year. And I said, well, that's great. I have the weather channel and the weather channel says next week you're getting snow. And sure enough, a week later, he calls me up and says, John, I need any, can, can you get me any combine you can? Do you have any friends who have combines? Because they couldn't harvest fast enough. So it absolutely devastated some of those farmers. Mold and rot were a huge issue. Uh, we all have heard sad stories, like some stories out of, out of Oregon. And, and uh, you know, so a lot of these folks um, had a really rough time. That, a lot of that had to do with how they harvested it and how they stored it. Um, uh, there was a mountain of supply that all hit at the same time. Uh, feminized seed that was not feminized. There was a big deal with that. I think we have a lot better control on that this year than we did last year and seed going hot due to varietal issues. Um, the other thing, the other lesson that we had was volume, right? So late licensing and planting led to harvest in California, led to a late harvest in California, which meant like we had late October, November harvests that were coming online. So when, just when we thought we had all the input from the market, here came, here came another wave. Uh, we had a very productive years in, in central and northern California. Uh, multiple large farms all came on, on the market at the same time. So more than, a, more than at least 10 farms greater than 2,000 acres were producing last year, which is not going to be the case this year. And the price point of CBD biomass fell to 50 cents a point or even lower. And so that made a huge difference. Uh, and that really hurt a lot of farmers. And there still are farmers sitting with a lot of crop in the, in the bins. Um, 
Real quick, I'll go through the price point on CBD just for a real quick overview. Right now, if you're buying isolate, you're spending any one through 50 kilos. You're spending $1,200 to $1,800 a kilo. That's about where we're at right now. 50 to 100, $1,000 to 1,200 a kilo. 100 to 1,000, 800 to a to $1,000 a kilo. And you, I'm sure there are people out there that are watching that go, I can get it cheaper. I'm just talking about a consistent supply from a reputable lab. Uh, market for tea free distillate, you can see the numbers. Uh, honestly, the one through 10, probably cheaper than that, probably 2,500 uh, right now at 3,000. Uh, you know, but it, the, the price goes all the way down. If you're buying a thousand or more, I mean, you can get it for $2,000 a kilo, probably even less than that, maybe 1,500, uh, excuse me, a liter. Um, CBG, however, the price is you know, initially they were at 20,000, 25,000. Heck, last year I paid 30,000 for one kilo of isolate. Now I can get one kilo at 6,500 all day. Um, if I'm buying 50 or more, I can probably get that number even lower than six, probably get it around 5,500 range, maybe 5,000 range. And uh, 100 to 1,000, you're in the 4,500 to $5,000 range. And that's because the price of CBG biomass has come down dramatically. Um, and the T and the T free distillate CBG T free distillate. You can see the, the price ranges that are there. I did not include crude in the, in this assessment, but crude, you know, you can spend $2,500 a liter to $3,500 a liter for crude right now on CBG. Um, the reason I, I, I'm so bullish on CBG is because it has a lot of things that you need CBD to do, but the prices, um, uh, for the farmer are still higher. And so the, the room for it to come down, uh, the, the spread for the farmer is a lot better. You have a lot better chance of making money, even if the prices fall. So I'm going to push through this kind of in, in, uh, in the interest of time. Um, okay. I would suggest that everybody go compare CBG versus CBD. So you can really understand what the what the difference is between the, the, the two, um, it's pretty, it's, it's very eye-opening. Um, primarily, I will tell you, CBG has a minor affinity for the CB1 receptor and the CB2 receptor, where CBD only has a minor affinity for the CB2 receptor. And there's a whole lot of health implications that are involved with that. Um, creating new products. When you create new products, I, it's really important to understand everything that all these cannabinoids do so that when you create a product, you're targeting a specific ailment, you know, and pick one or two or three um, and then market towards that. Um, CBG, I'm, I'm going to save a little bit of this in the interest of time again, but basically in the female cannabis plant, CBGA is the first cannabinoid created. Uh, from this molecule comes CBC, CBD, CBN, Delta 1 through 10, THC, as well as many other cannabinoids um, that are really named or really numbered and not even named. Um, the CBG, uh, it's known to stimulate the alpha 2 receptor. Um, it explains, uh, uh, let's see, CBG really, um, it's very good up for high blood pressure. Um, there's a whole lot of other stuff that CBG does. Probably the most important right now with the whole COVID thing is its ability to kill bacteria. Um, and it's, it's, um, it has the ability to kill viruses and such as that. So there's a lot of market that, a lot of market opportunity in making products specifically geared towards that. Uh, CBC cannabichromine is one of the most abundant uh, phytocannabinoids available. Um, it's also incredibly anti-inflammatory. Um, how CBC exerts uh, the effects on the body has not been well-defined. Um, it, it may contribute to potential therapeutic effectiveness, um, but really the thing that's most important for people to know about CBC is that CBC acts like an amplifier for other cannabinoids. And so having CBC in your product will make your product better, for lack of a, for lack of a better explanation. Um, and I'll say that you guys are welcome to go through this slide. I, I believe this is being recorded and hopefully you'll have some chance to do some research on your own on CBC. Uh, so here's a, here's an interesting cannabinoid CBL. Um, it's one of the least known studies, study cannabinoids in the plant. And so there's not a 
ton of information that we have on it, um, but the one thing that we do know about it, and there are some labs that are doing work right now, is its anti-cancer effect. So again, if you're making a product, that's a good, that's a good focus. CBT, again, another, another good cannabinoid for you to study. Not a whole lot of information on it, but thought I'd include it for you guys to, to see. Here's probably the most important one that you're probably not aware of, or a lot of folks aren't aware of, and that's Delta-8 THC. Uh, Delta-8 THC has, uh, it's, it has a lot of benefits. It'll, it'll get you, um, it'll, I don't want to say it'll get you high, but it'll get you high without the paranoia, basically, for lack of a better term. So a lot of folks are, are looking at that for an anti-anxiety type of drug. Um, it's really got a lot of potential, and also people use it to get rid of hangovers. So that's another product that you can make. Uh, terpenes, I'm going to save this explanation on terpenes, um, fortunately for, for lack of time, but um, terpenes are key and critical to how cannabinoids work, and they work hand in hand with them. They are what makes the entourage effect. The terpenes and the flavonoids in combination are really what makes the, the entourage effect work. So it's really important that you understand what terpenes you have in your plants and keep, keep really focused on that. Um, so saving the farm, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this here. Saving the farm, our, our, our current 2020 standing, um, you know, what we know, COVID-19 has had an impact on the amount of farms that are planting this year. A lot of farmers are not growing hemp this year because of the, uh, because of the over, overproduction in 2019. Um, every seed producer that we've spoken with is down 50 to 75 percent from last year. Uh, more, more farmers are planting CBG than, CB, than, than planted let CBG last year, and it's probably almost going to be an even split between CBG and CBD this year. Uh, mount, the mountain of supply is being absorbed, and the prices are beginning to rebound, that's for sure. The quality and variety of seed has significantly improved, which is, a, which is really fantastic for the market. Demand from the consumer side is still increasing at a decent rate. The consumer is now looking for smokable hemp, and is becoming much more educated about it. Uh, most large farms, those farms being a thousand plus acres, have dramatically scaled back operations. They're doing 200 acres or 50 acres or not growing at all. Uh, prices of CBD biomass and CBG biomass are likely to stabilize, and it's possible that there may be a, sh a shortage in some parts of the country this fall. And that's a very real thing. I, I'm telling you, there's not as much product on the market coming this year as there was last year for sure. Um, and you're likely to see those prices really kind of move up in the spring of 2021 if that trend continues. Uh, there's also likely to be positive legislation that's going to force the FDA to allow sales of CBD and, and other cannabinoids as dietary supplements by the fall of 2020, but uh, no promises. Um, saving the farm. So real quick, the best way to do it, in my opinion, is brand yourself. Why? Because counting on brokers to move your product is probably not going to pan out. Uh, selling direct to the consumer will allow you to make a much higher profit margin. Remember, your biomass and your flour will go bad over time. It, it, it is going to um, break down, lose its flavor, lose its potency, degrade um, over time. If you sell your own product, you will have um, you, you'll not have to sell up, sell out uh, to all the bottom feeders. And trust me, there are going to be plenty of bottom feeders coming for your product. And uh, one thing I always say is, you know, why make another company dollars for selling products that they want to pay you pennies for? Uh, and then the how on it is formulate your own, form, formulate a plan on how you're going to sell your, your crop now, right? So um, I like to say that you should plan for the fall and the spring and plan for the spring and the fall. Um, you know, pre-sell your crop with real deposits directly, uh, directly, from companies who are already in the space. If you don't know who they are, then research and find out who's actually selling product and contact them directly. Tell them about your crop, what you have, and um, how great your product is, why they should use yours. And also don't wait to start selling until the fall. Um, don't grow more than you can sell is probably the most important lesson I can share. And that's everyone that grandma wants to go and grow just as big a crop as they can but they have no idea what it's, you know, how much they're going to actually be able to sell um, unless they already have experience. And most of the experienced farmers that have done it have scaled back. And so that, you know, take a lesson from someone that's already done it. If they're scaling back, you should probably scale back too, because they already have 
connections in the industry. And so they're, you know, if they're scaling back, it's for a reason. Um, you know, um, and I, one thing I will tell you is that given the amount of interest that the consumer is showing for other cannabinoids like CBC and CBG, a farmer would be wise to grow more than one cannabinoid. And uh, I would say this, remember, life's better blended, so grow wisely, my friends. With that, I'll with, take I was like, With that, I'm gonna hop into Q&A. We, we have several questions and we've got about five minutes left. So the question I have, I'm gonna blend two different questions since you love blending. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, people are asking about what's the price per pound of uh, CBD hemp flour and then also, is harvesting for a smokable flower a better plan for this year, in your opinion? So I'll answer this real quick. Um, right now, the market range is anywhere from $150 to $500 a pound. It depends upon, actually, as high as $800 a pound. depends upon what you're growing. And um, so if you're growing cherry wine, you're probably only going to be getting $150 a pound, maybe. Uh, if you're growing a really gassy, uh, like a CB diesel, um, you know, something that has a real diesel smell. Like I always say, if I can smell it, I can sell it. Um, those are going to are going to command a much higher price. The prices have come up. It was that we were moving at $100 a pound for a smokable flour, and now we're moving at $250 to $300 a pound on average. Um, and then when it comes to growing smokable flour, I, I would tell you grow both. Um, really focus on the tops of your plants. Harvest your tops and treat those like gold. Um, you know, make sure you're curing those right spend a little bit of time paying paying extra attention. If you take your tops early, um, it'll allow the bottoms of your plants to expand and the buds will, will grow a little bit further. It's an old grower trick, right? So you'll get more cannabinoids in your, in your biomass. So you can actually do both. You can have a, uh, you can grow for flower and for biomass off the same plant. So hopefully that answers it in general. Yeah, that was a great answer. Uh, Question coming from Jim is cannabinoid combos. What about a CBD slash THC combo? He That's says one to one stories. Any thoughts or comments? Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, uh, and and when when I say that, it's it's really CBD and, and THC and combo are very effective. The problem for the hemp farmer is selling it in most states. Um, so getting that product to the market legally will be tough. However, if you can get that product to the market legally, it's very effective. It's very effective, especially for cancer patients, those folks that are dealing with, um, with issues that, like, for instance, there are certain types of breast cancers where uh, CBD is, is much more effective at, um, at limiting the metastasis of the cancer. And, and it, you know, CB, CBD doesn't cause apoptosis, but THC does cause apoptosis. So when you're using those in combo, they work really well. They also work really well for pain. But I'll tell you what, what works even better would be Delta 8 THC and CBD in combo because then you limit the paranoia effect of it. There's almost no paranoia. And, uh, and man, that's a really effective medicine for folks suffering from PTSD or depression. Right now with COVID, a lot of folks are having real issues with anxiety and depression. And uh, that's a really good medicine. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, next question comes from Kyle. It says, do you have insight on cultivation or harvest practices to increase CBG? You know, the best way that I would say, uh, to, to answer that in short, yeah, there are, there are a couple of tricks that would take a while to, to explain. Um, but to increase your overall CBD content, the best, the easiest trick that I can tell you is, take your flower off the top. So if you have a single cola on the top of your plant, cut that flower about a week before you harvest the rest and your cannabinoid content will then go to all of the smalls. And so when those smalls get bigger, your overall content, your overall biomass content, uh, your, your CBD content and your biomass will go up. And you know, biomass typically sells for 50 cents to a dollar a point. Um, so if you go from 8% um, homogenized to 12% homogenized, you just increase $4 a pound. And that's a big deal if you're taking 50,000 pounds. So that, that simple trick can really help you out. And the other thing is it, it can save you your crop from going hot if you take the tops uh, off the plant uh, early. Like I said, a week to two before harvesting the rest of the plant, you'll, you'll buy extra time. So... 
Great. That's a great answer. Okay, we got time for one last question. This one comes from Joe. Joe says, how many ounces per CBG plant would you expect? And I'm guessing that's if everything went according to plan. So that really goes down to genetics. Um, and that, that could go anywhere from four to, from like, let's say a quarter pound to a half a pound per plant grown right. If, you know, and of course that, that's also assuming that you're growing in, that you're putting plants in the ground in late May, early June and not late June, early July, right? So there's all these, these variables grown right, planted at the right time, you can anticipate getting anywhere from a half a pound to a pound and a half per plant if your spacing is correct and your soils are right. And in some cases, I know some folks that are doing three plus pounds of CBG. CBG is an amazing, at least the genetics that I've seen, and I'm not gonna try and shout out one to the other, but <laughs> I'll tell you right, right now, the Crawford brothers did a wonderful job with their genetics, and I know folks that have grown that, and I'm not pumping them, I'm just sharing. Uh, you know, those plants grow gigantic and they, they put on a lot of weight. So uh, I have grow, grow, grow wisely. And I hope that my little part of this helped you guys out. Yeah, well, we really appreciate your time, John. This has been super informative. I'm sure to everyone who is new to hemp and also a returning hemp farmer as well. We appreciate your time and I look forward to seeing everyone at our final session, which is our Hopstone uh, State of the Union in hemp session that starts at 2 45 p.m central standard time so we'll right. see you all there and thanks again john for your time absolutely if i can just give a shout out to my to my website blendedcanna.com um where this is my new venture where i'm doing it just for me so we'll you bet. we look forward to seeing people there so okay. life's better blended take care awesome thanks have a great day everyone we'll see you thanks. at the next session